to Final Draft versus Scrivener. Um, <laughs> the ultimate <laughs> smash showdown. Saturday, um, Sunday, Sunday. Sorry, Sunday. Sorry. 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 The intent of it was to get somebody started with Scrivener to be able to move to Final move Draft. To final to be draft. Professional. That was the so, so it's, it's so Final Draft is already won. Yes. <laughs> well, but I'm talking about it's beginners to Final Draft. Right? Hashtag for everyone. <laughs> Okay, just give us a background with maybe both. Is a large buxom, mostly naked woman going to hit you with a chair at any point? Okay. No, I'm not. I don't have one time. Business locations, they're very either spare, really smart, like they look like the back of a library with the stacks and stuff, or they're very classy. And I walked into this one, it was like walking into a bordel. It was the funniest thing. Not, not in a mean way, but it was just all dark, dark wood and red trim. But not just red, but the deep, like velvety red that hookers wear at westerns. So it was so weird. I was not sure I was in the right place. I was like, is this W? Oh, okay, wrestling magazines. Um, that's all I contribute to this whole thing. I'm standing, by the way, because if I sit here, I feel like you guys can't see me, and I, and I have to turn sideways easy, because I can't turn my head very well, because I have in it. So I apologize to my fellow guys. Um, my name is Michael Bright Collins. I am an <coughs> international bestseller, and I'm a produced screenwriter. I'm a member of the Writers Guild of America, which for those of you who don't know is the elite, the most elite writing group in the whole world. Um, and that's, that is a quantitative, not brag. It is harder to get into the Writers Guild of America than to be a player in Major League Baseball. Yeah, statistically. Um, so, they, 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 they've relaxed their standards recently, folks, because I'm interested in um, Well, to get in it, you have to do some very professional stuff, and then you pay them, it's like three grand now. And then you give them more, 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 more than that. You, know, it's, it's, you pay them that, but then you pay them 1.5% of your earnings. And that's what I was going to say, and then you give them a percentage of your earnings for the rest of your life. And, but it's worth it, because like I had trouble getting paid by a production company, and they came, they, I called them, and I'm pretty sure they sent two large Italian men with big knuckles over, because I got my money. <laughs> Polish. Polish is that Does the production right? company have a horse, too? <laughs> um, anyway, so as part of screenwriting, I am a produced screenwriter. I also, um, I had the most screenplays in history get to the quarter and semifinals of a, the Nickel Fellowship, um, which is a big, huge screenwriting competition. So I've been doing this for a while. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Good competition. Yeah. Um, and so how many people here are screenwriters? How you define? define. <laughs> How many people are, have, have ever put pen or finger to keystroke and tried to write a screenplay? Fade in. Then awesome. you are a screenwriter. <laughs> yes. yes no, you never want to tell people you're trying to be a screenwriter. You are a screenwriter. Uh, don't wait for somebody to give you permission to be living the life and be the person that you know that you are. Um, because if you're tentative about it and if there's, if they, they can smell the fear. And, Literally, if there's what a writer's number one job is to dispel fear and reject confidence. Uh, like my co-writer and I have a, a, a mantra which is to speak quickly with confidence and no one will ever know the difference. Um, but like, yeah, you can have the best story in the world if you go in there for depth and timidity, then like, it's just really good that. Um, but so, I have to give you a tiny bit of background on, on myself also, and then, then some of the stuff we're going to come into. Uh, my name is Jacob Payne. Uh, I am also a WGA member. Um, uh, I probably have the least number of wins in the nickel in terms of the, uh, the I think I made the quarter final. By the way, that's a cool thing for like an hour while people are talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I think I made the quarter final and they made it somehow. Like, but like, um, but uh, started, I've been writing full time for like seven years now. Uh, I had a tacit deal with my parents when I did sell screenplay by the time I was 30. I would uh, go and like get an MBA or a law degree or a real job in some way that could provide for families someday. Um, but uh, when I was like 29 and like 7 um, <laughs> uh, finally sold a, a script to a very small studio and uh, quit my day job half a year after that and I've been writing basically full time since then. Um, and it's the dream come true. It's pinch yourself every day, like, um, you know, like, like living in Disneyland and running through Daisies. Um, <laughs> if, Daisy, if, if Disneyland is full of angry people with hikes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I just accept when it's not. It's 
except when you're actually doing the work. <laughs> then, then it can be challenging. Um, but uh, I've been really lucky and had a bunch of good opportunities. I've worked with most of the major studios, I've worked with Paramount, uh, on Star Trek 3, I'm writing Star Trek 4 with, with my co-writer, um, I've worked on an X-Men TV show with, with Fox, um, a Flash Gordon reboot, um, a Jungle Cruise with Dwayne Johnson. Um, That's so something I'm looking forward to. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. I, I'm gonna like, you know, stop myself every every turn from like putting in like, can you smell what the rock is cooking? Like, you know, I, I wanted to put it in there, but I had. Um, but uh, you know, so um, that we just literally finished that Trinidad Dizzy like this weekend. Um, so uh, they're they're ready now. So you know, not how that one goes. Um, but uh, so yeah, those are a couple of things I've been doing. So what we want to talk about today um, are. I'm Fiona, I write screenplays, I write novels, and I YouTube. Fiona and then. Uh, my name is Blake Hasman, I am not part of the WGA. Uh, but I did have a script go into the uh, semi-finalists of the Nickel Fellowship. And having agencies and production companies contact me to read my script was very surreal because I spent five years sending out query letters with uh, either no reply or angry no thank yous. Uh, <laughs> that's not Yeah, I know that. That's a uh, that, that was a that was a learning process for me. Uh, I work in independent film. Uh, I my first feature called Top and Trouble screened here last night, and uh, we are working for our next feature and also doing a web series. I uh, am also a, a co-host on a new podcast called The Script Crypt. It's where we take screenplays that have never been produced and uh, evaluate them and compare and contrast them with the versions that actually did get produced. Like, for example, episode one, which is now out, we did a, an evaluation of the version of Alien 3, which was written by William Gibson of Neuromancer fame. Mm -hmm. And uh, compared and contra contrasted it to the version of Alien 3 that was actually written and released. Uh, we've also done our second one that's, uh, that's being edited right now. We did, a, we did a, a, an evaluation of a, a Total Recall version that was written by David Cronenberg. And we're also planning on doing uh, the Iron Man script that was written for Tom Cruise in the 90s. We're going to do uh, the, the Lord of the Rings version that was going to be directed by John Borman back in the 70s. We're going to do the lay bracket version of Empire, which is nothing like the Empire that was, that was shot in the So we're very excited about this new project. And, uh, oh, and I also run a screenwriting group here in Salt, or in Salt Lake called the Utah Filmmakers, and I am known as the uh, as the uh, script Nazi when it comes to grammar and uh, format and stuff. Yes. And I'm trying to learn, so I'm just known as a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you guys. How many of you actually have Scrivener and know what Scrivener is? Actually, and how many of you have Final Draft? It's just okay. And then how many of you don't know what to do or where to go or what to get? Do my. Yeah, okay. It's so hard to like. Uh, I don't want to say it where they're all. I'm proud of my ignorance. No, and I think, I think <laughs> I'm just going to throw this out here. Write. You know, I mean, you need formatting. You need to, but start writing, even if you don't know what you're doing. Just make sure you're writing. Um, does anyone want to take us out on um, how the two compare? Well, oh, like cost point, like at what point or? Well, here's the thing, my perspective, and I, and I suspect Jenny's going to back me up on this, is if you want to be an indie, um, like Blake, and Blake, by the way, is always so humble, but indie is a tremendously tough job, and there is actually a lot of money, and my manager's constantly going, like, do you really need to be WGA? Because there's a lot of opportunities out there that have opened up with new media and stuff. So don't think just because you're not WGA or you're an indie that you're in a bad situation, because they do some amazing stuff, you know? Like George Lucas is not a member of the director's guild. He did okay. <laughs> but that said, if you want to work with the studio system and it, at that level and in those people, you have to work with Final Draft because that's the industry um, norm. 99% of them use Final Draft and the other 1% are probably, their last thing was in the 70s. And 
also one of the real things that a lot of people don't think about is it's great to be hired. It is great to be to sell a screenplay. But it is a whole new level of great when they say, can you do rewrites? Because they pay you a lot of money. And you, for me at least, the rewrites are easier because I don't have to come up with everything from scratch. They're kind of harder because they go, you know, your black six foot tall detective should be a lesbian dog, and that makes a story change. But you don't want to say, sure, sure, and they say, send me over the changes, unlock the final draft, and you're going, because that kills the confidence to some extent, doesn't it? <laughs> so if you want to work in that world, you have to, you have to have final draft, and you have to understand it. I've never met any lesbian dogs, but I agree. Yeah. Well, they're nice. I've got nothing against them. They're great yeah. party people. <laughs> um, but I think we're scaling that up here. Um, but, um, yeah, no, certainly so, so the rewrite world is, is one that, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting between yeah, building your own house from scratch uh, versus going in and sort of doing a plumbing job on someone else's maybe well-constructed, maybe not well-constructed house. And, you know, sometimes, you know, like a plumber, you get in there and think it's going to be easy, but then as soon as you start working up the floorboards and you see, you know, that the pipes are really kind of rusted out and, and uh, you have know, black mold down there and, and you totally need to reinstall everything in the plumbing. Like, you know, sometimes it's actually easier to <coughs> do it from scratch than it is to, than to, to, uh, to try to recreate. Yeah, back to the figure, but um, it just depends on the project. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. How many, um, when you're doing your film, I mean, you're writing, screenwriting, how many um, authors, what do they use, what are they using when they're coming to your screenwriting? Um, and, and, and first off, please use some type of screenwriting software. Mm -hmm. Because I've been told by someone who worked for an agency, because uh, I learned how to write screenplays on Word back in the day when I was in college. <laughs> That was that was my emphasis at film school, screenwriting, and so we had format pounded into our heads uh, by Paul Larson, who was over the screenwriting at, at the University of Utah, and so that's what I wrote on, and that's the script that got uh, did so well at the Nickel Fellowship. I wrote that on Word, and then I sent it out, and one of them called me on it when they when they got back to me and gave me a no thank you. He's like. Screenwriting software, and I was like, No, I use Word. And they complimented me on how well formatted it was on Word, but he said, You really need to get some type of screenwriting software because he says, If we can tell, if we get a script that we're, that we're hoping to consider, and we can tell it's not on screenwriting software, we don't need to give it a read. We, we, we just give it an immediate pass because. And I said, well, that's, that's really interesting. Why is that? And he said, because in our experience, it's a waste of time to read something that hasn't been, that's been written on Word or some other non-software program because there's going to be formatting problems all through. For, for, for how politically liberal and you know, sort, of, sort of Hollywood is, it's amazing how aesthetically conservative it is when it comes to, because this is the same format that other people were using like, in the 30s. Like, you still use Courier Final Draft as the font because it's like what you, it looks like a typewriter. I mean, so, like, literally, it's, it's, it's aesthetics that are 80 years old and it's what the page is. It's just like people sort of grew up, you know, as they read, they go, well, what should the page look like? It should look like you're on typewriter, of course. I mean, like, you know, so if you turned it in in, like, time to your Roman, they, they, like, they couldn't even read it. It would be like, what is this? I don't even know. Like, why is it? Like, career React 12. But there, there, is, but a, yeah. there is a reason for it because, and they could have done it with other time fonts, yeah. but that whole one minute page thing, that shifts if you're using Times New Roman because you can fit a lot more letters into it. Um, I got. I was a reader at uh, Sony for a while, and one of the things that happened because I had to read everything, and I got paid by the script back then. And I had a screenplay that was Times New Roman, 112 pages, and I just started screaming because it's going to take me 18 hours to read, and that meant my hourly pay went down. And you don't want to piss off your first reader because they're going to pass it. Well, what, because we're talking about what it needs to look like, let's go ahead and go into this part. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is sort of just a, a little. Um, you know, on some, some things that you know, I ended up reading a lot of stuff like you know, scripts of younger writers, people who are just sort of getting into it, and like there's some common pitfalls that people make in terms of like what they'll do on the page. And some of this is just like, like you say, you don't want to piss off your first reader, and there's ways to, to make a screenplay look good on the page or look easy to read on the page. Um, and your job as a screenwriter is visual storytelling, and you're doing that on a couple of different levels. Like, one, you are literally writing pictures. Um, that is like, that, that, is, that is the number one job. And it's a strange thing because you're sort of you know, an artist draws pictures, and then people look at the picture and they sort of see what you made. But you know, with this, you're trying to direct their, their mind to another another sort of experience, the experience of imagining what the movie would look like. So your job is to write a picture. So the sort of first level on which you're doing that is 
You're, you're actually trying to make something that on its own, own merits looks good on a page and looks accessible to read. So, um, sorry, really quick, is this you presenting or all of us talking? I'm fine either way. We provide some things um, that we think about it. We're going to go through all of this stuff. Can you guys see it well enough or do I need to turn on the lights? Do you want me to turn down the lights? Okay, that's fine. But I'll take maybe 10 minutes for this. Just because like, yeah. I'm going to jump in on your yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Like creating a scene, but you want to do it in just right amount. And a good way to do this is read a lot of screenplays. 
You know, if, if there's a movie you admire, just go online and find the screenplay. You can find pretty much any script now. See how they did it. Uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, the two things I was going to ask is one, how, where would you recommend finding, you know, screenplays? But just I, imsdb.com. Imsdb. Internet Movie Screenplay Database. Or to ruse script around and, or, and make, make, make sure that it's not just someone who transcribed it. Make sure yeah. it's, look, look, look at the actual author, like go on IMDb and find who the actual screenwriter was. Google the screenplay name, that writer's name, and then script PDF, usually. Yeah, and, yeah. That will, and not director's cut. Yeah. yeah, I found a lot of scripts, PDFs of scripts, by just Googling the script's name and then PDF and it comes up. It doesn't always do, but quite a few have, have come up that way. Yeah. 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 I've done that. They all look so radically different. So, you, you know, what I've been doing, experiencing, what you guys are saying is like, wait, there seems to be a disconnect, and I'm not sure if it's just like, because I've been unlucky mm -hmm. in getting these transcribed ones versus the actual ones, which is... Don't ever read the transcribed ones, those are useless. Yeah. Those are done. That could be, I didn't know about those. That could be done by a 12 year old sitting in, like the whole Simpsons series, you can get transcriptions of, but like, I don't care. Um, but all of them do, they look different, none of them look exactly the same because they're different authors, so we're, it's like, what, I can walk past a hamburger and start eating it, I have to be very careful to have this body. And this jerk, I can tell, probably, you know, shoves stuff in his face all day long and he looks like this. So we lose weight differently or gain weight less differently, but generally, if you exercise more and eat less, that's a good thing that most people respond to. So we're giving you kind of outline basics, and then you'll see them practiced in the different screenplays in different ways. But as beginners, as starters, learn this stuff, and then put your stamp on it. Don't try and put format on your stamp. That's the wrong direction. One thing you see often in screenplays is the, the author will use the phrase, we see this, or, or we, you know, and that's, that's something that a lot of screenwriters use. Personally, I don't use it. I don't care for it. But that doesn't make me wrong and them right, or vice versa. It's a choice. It, it's a choice. Yeah. And there are classes you can take, and there are books you can read. If you're really unsure about the kind of formatting that you're seeing as you're trying to find, then really study format. Really study, like, you know. Yeah. So, so, some of the slides on the. Uh, so that you know what to look for. So this, this next one was just you know what one tool you can use if you find yourself getting lots of text. Spike it with dialogue. What what, what is your eye instantly go to on that page? Get down. Oh, Get down. <laughs> right. Um, so and it's because it's like this little breakout. So it's like it, it, it gives you a moment to breathe as, you, as you're reading these long blocks of text. Um, so if you find yourself with like a big heavy action scene, like you know find a little way to just spike it with something so it gives your gives your reader a moment to catch your breath. Um, this is another thing about widows and orphans. Just look at how this looks on the page. What, what do you notice about it? You don't have to really read it, but just try yeah, do what your eyes would do if you were reading it. Strapping yeah. out, there's lots of time. Yeah, you gotta kind of go like, like you know, it's, it's, it's kind of jerky a little bit, you know, and, and your eyes can do twice as much work to go back to the beginning of the line for something that you're not actually gonna, you know, it's only, it's only gonna be a single word. And so, really, oh, so I don't want to show you the difference. This is the same, the exact same content done without any orphans. So that's with the orphans and widows, and, and that's without it. And also, you're able to fit one, two, three, four, five more lines worth of stuff on, on this page. So your screenplay, if you do this throughout, you're going to cut out 10% of it. So instead of an executive opening a, a script that is 120 pages, it's 108. And so your, your young script reader says, ah, oh, I only have to take 108 minutes to read this and not 120. I have 12 minutes for lunch. And you've, you've just done yourself 12 minutes of favor, and they like you that much better. And literally, you've changed nothing in terms of your content. So again, orphans and widows. And that's the first thing, by the way, I do when I'm working to shorten my thing, because everybody's in love with their work, so I go through and if I get rid of a couple of those words, if I see them, like the, the middle two right here, let's see if I can do this, this one and this one, I look at that, and it's okay to write this stuff in your first or early drafts, and you just shove them together and it became three lines instead of six, or yeah, three lines, yeah. so, and, and nothing changed, so I always look for a way to get rid of this little thing and this little thing, Sometimes it's just getting rid of a word, and sometimes it's squishing together, but it really helps shorten your script. And you can also cheat a little bit. There's, there's a ruler adjustment, so I found it after this. I don't know if Scrivener does this, but there's a ruler at the top. If it's just a single character, and like, no, this is the perfect construction of this one line, like, and I can't lose a single thing, then like, you can cheat the ruler at the top, and like, it'll bump up, and like, no one will know. Like, I'll cheat within three or four of those little things, and it's fine. If you're doing eight or ten, like, they don't know this, but. Oh, also, there's a, there's a thing that it, their format says, normal format, and there's a, 
tight, yeah, very tight and loose and very loose, which basically the spacing between um, the uh, lines changes. And don't use that because people can tell, and the tight and the very tight particularly, you can get away with it more, I found, on the loose side. I, I use tight stuff. I never use very tight, but I'll, yeah, I'll, very I'll tight use tight but I've had people come back and go, you tightened this, didn't you? Because <laughs> they say, cut that big, and you're like, all right. <laughs> 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 it's really, you know, so much better, so much better. What are we going to do? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. So, <clears throat> if I am leaning towards wanting to start in animated shorts a la Pixar style, mm -hmm. um, where there is no dialogue and a fair number of them, how would you recommend, I mean, if I can't spike with dialogue, you don't want to have huge descriptions, but... Make, make it manageable. I, I'd say try not to make it so that it's two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines. Try to make it so it's ten lines. Ten. Make it like a three line, and then a two line, and then a one, and then a two, and then a three. Like, vary it up on the page a little bit if you can. Also, if you do it in terms of like where the cut would come, like if you're in a POV, like um, you know, or where the sort of next chunk of information is, there's a sort of logical way to organize each chunk of information as you're doing it. Um, you know, there's a drama even to the sort of when when you sort of go to the next paragraph, what, what is the dramatic effect of that? Um, so even without dialogue, there's ways to do it. And another way that that I very often use actually, since again I write horror and it's a it's a much more sparse sort of thing, is if there's a series of quick scenes, I will write. The car comes towards him, dot, dot, dot. He jumps out of the way, dot, dot, dot. The car crashes into the wall, dot, dot, dot. And so, you don't use that all the time because that's a spice. And any time you use a spice, you don't use it too much or your meal gets destroyed. It tastes like onion and rosemary instead of like leg like of lamb or whatever. So you want to be very careful, but that's a good way to make, you've got two line paragraph, two line paragraph, three line paragraph, one line, one line, one line, and it's a short line, it only takes up half the page, so you still preserve some of that white space that people like. Or, or something like this, where like, yeah, because mother's already caught in the current, she's clawing, shoving for her son's outstretched hand. But James watches as the swelling mass of bodies keeps pushing mother and son further and further apart. So you can actually like kind of do, do the sort of feeling of what it feels like on the page. <laughs> For one of my just going on to this, one of my one of my scripts, I actually this is so much harder. Here, I wrote the door, the door opens. So and I put it in the middle slowly. <laughs> so it's, like they can see the door pulling over, to, and also like it gave a sense of the pacing and stuff. Yeah, you, 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 you know, do all kinds of stuff like that, but even like simple things of like you know where you're trying to get the sense, the sense of like. Quick close up of something, like, you know, it's like, um, let's see, true, false, plenty for a grip, a shirt, a suitcase, anything, but a hand darts in out of nowhere. You know, so like, it's like, that's like this sort of shock, kind of like, you like suddenly see a hand darts in, you know, like, um, so you can sort of play around with things, you can give that little, like, you know, again, that little break where this has almost the same effect of a line of dialogue where suddenly you get this nice big chunk of white space. And it's something we talked about yesterday is as a screenwriter, you do not, you do not direct the film in the script, you do not put in camera angles. But that's a perfect example of how you can throw in things that are like cues to the director to shoot the scene a certain way that you possibly are seeing it in your head. Yeah. 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 Um, so here, here's a couple other sort of like ways in terms of like, so take a look at this one in terms of what your eye has to do. You don't have to read it because it, it's a little small, but like, what does your eye have to do to process that page? Jump back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're sort of going middle. Left, middle, left. Now this is literally, again, the exact same content. Just slightly rearranged. You have dialogues, you have an action. Isn't it, isn't it surreal how much just the way that I first realized that screenwriting, the, 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 kind of, the kind of writing it has most in common is poetry. Because it's totally compressed, you're allowed to use sentence fragments. You're allowed to use um, different ways of, of laying things out. The only thing that defines a poem is that the author has absolute control over the, where the lines fall on the page. Because everything else that people think of poetry is also found in prose. And the time I realized it is when I read Alien, which is a screenplay I recommend everybody read. It is awesome. And it reads like this creepy, gothic poetry. It's really cool, definitely cool. I mean, so a couple, couple ways you can do this, a couple like you know, tricks you can say, well wait, but I have an action I need to happen between these lines of dialogue, how can I make it happen? Um, so if you notice like, you know, um, it will be over soon. Holden narrows his eyes, looking at her suspicious. What are you talking about? In another way, it will be, it will be over soon, turning to her. What are you talking about? 
You know, so you can just you can bump it into a parenthetical. I mean, parentheticals are technically supposed to only be for like characterize the emotion of how the person's talking. Um, you know, but like you could just say even like you'll be overseen. Oh, do you say suspicious? What are you talking about? Or like off her expression. Yeah, off her expression. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so there, there's a way to sort of get the effect of what you wanted in sorry in, in that action line. Hold her story. Look at her suspicious. And just have a parenthetical. Because the parenthetical, you're right, almost it's, like, it's, all, it's right there in the center of the page, just like the, like the action, that's our, like the dialogue line is. So parentheticals are a nice way to sort of like make, make it so you're not jumping back and forth like that. Um, but parentheticals piss some people off. Every one of these decisions, you're going to make somebody happy and you're going to piss somebody off. So you kind of have to be aware of the choices you're making. Definitely. A lot of actors just detest parentheticals. There's some famous ones that just scratch them out because they're like, that's my job, you bastard. Yeah. So they don't let me know what to do. Yeah. So, but it, it, these, so these are all techniques that you use, and you use them knowingly rather than just being like, "Hey, Quentin Tarantino, his he uses three quarters dialogue, and the other quarter is the F word. I'm going to do that <laughs> um, because you're mimicking without understanding." So these are just trying to explain what, why these things are done. Definitely, definitely, and, and yeah, um, even when you do use friends, that it was used in Spirit, you're like, "Friends never, never use more than three per page." Um, okay, so a couple of things. Uh, again, it's, it's sort of hard to say, though, but like, this is just action in plain text. Um, and this is that same thing, but using a couple of your, your tools, caps, underlining, talents, and bold. Um, on the page, it's, it's literally the same thing. You just look at it. It looks more interesting on the page, um, and you get a little more sense of variety. It's like colors. It's like painting in black and white versus painting with, with colors. You know, when you use the cat metallics, like, I know that that's a, that's a sound, you know, boom, or whatever, like, wham, like, if Wham is just done in WHAM period, it looks so it looks so sad down there. Look, Wham. Where <laughs> <laughs> George Wham? Yeah. Like, you know, um, like Swats hold aside like an insect. You know, like you, you sort of get a very specific sort of image there, like, as opposed to like you know Swats hold aside like an insect. Like, uh, and you can go overboard, and you know people do. But, like, so even the slug lines, the slug lines here are bolded, and that's that's a, a change I've seen really in the last like. Three, four years, like more slug lines get bolded now. It used to just look all over like that. But like when you have a bold slug line, that's again, it's like when you turn the page, it's a promise to the reader that like, okay, there's gonna be a new scene here, I'm gonna get out of the scene of my board, like, you know, by the three quarters of the day down the page. Your eye just sort of tracks it unconsciously. You notice know the bold. Um, okay, any other thoughts on oh, oh, okay. Yeah, also right here, this is a good thing too. Um, see there's two two uh, spaces here between the slug line and the last line of the action. That is not a requirement. Uh, some people do one and some people do two. Again, like the bold, more people are doing two, I've noticed. But uh, if you need to shorten up your script and lose five pages, make them all one. And if your script's running really short, you can make those two. And I like the two because, again, I love white space. And How do you define slug line? Oh, the slug line is this one where you're moving to a new scene, a new place, and a new um, section of action. And you, it always starts with interior, exterior. There's exceptions, but you always start with interior, exterior. And then it tells you. Um, where it's happening, and it tells you what time it is. He's, this is unusual. You usually, you know, you start with day or night, or the two people do, but in action, you do same because stuff is all compressed, and you, you kind of have to know it's not just any time of the day this is happening coterminiously. It's happening right now at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Day, night, continuous, moments later, same. Um, and go ahead and explain why that's important when you're a director. <laughs> Because you, you have a really good explanation. Well, the, the reason why you need to, to know whether it's day or night is in production, they're going to have to know how to light the set, whether you're indoors or outdoors. Like, we shot stuff that takes place at night in the script, but we're shooting it in the middle of the day. And this is interior, so what we do is we get, we get heavy black material to cover the windows. Or vice versa. We shot, you know, for, for the film I screened last night, we had to do nights and weekends because uh, it was low, 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 low budget. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were shooting some stuff at night that took place during the day, so we, we put some 4Ks outside the window and just just faced them inside, and it, it, created, it made it seem like there was sunlight coming in through the window. So. It's, 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 screenplay format is is there for you as you write the story, but it's also there for the many people who will be working on the script to know, uh, to take the proper cues and know what to do for each scene as you're getting ready to shoot it. Do you guys know what a line? I'll go ahead. Yeah, you want to make it as easy, easy as ever possible. Uh, it, it, sorry, it's easy as possible. It's one of the I wanted to sort of point out. And this is, J.D. Payne totally silent. This is, every other writer might disagree, but like, 
you know, I'll, I, I say we because I have to have a right word. Like, we have the tots and, and underlining is different, like, you know, um, there's an underlining here of, like, underlining sort of, in some ways, if they were only going to read those things in the script, and, like, if you were going to get to JJ, JJ only had 20 minutes to read the script, and he was going to go through the script and only read the underlinings, he could still sort of get the plot. Uh, I mean, like, you know, like, so this is, like, an important beat where this guy is saying, like, I'd like to take a side of Holden, you were all I had left at birth, and you betrayed her. You know, like, that's a big moment in the script. And you betrayed her. You know, this guy's accusing his, his, his effectively son in law of, of betraying the, the, the daughter that he lost. You know, or like, if you just want to have to, like, this guy is shouting, like, we have to let her go, Tom. We have to let her go. Like, that's more italics. More italics also are great for, like, internal thoughts in an action line. And I don't think I have any on this, this page, but, like, you know, um, if, 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 like, a person is, like, you know, someone looks at someone, like, sizing them up, or, like, um, tell us to think more about that later on, or you know, wondering what she's really meaning or something like. Well, you're at the bottom, starting toward Holden to finish the job. That's kind of oh yeah, that's really internal because he's this is the end of the you know the conflict between them. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's true. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's but again, these are all tools, and you can develop your own sort of style of them. It's, it's like we're five different. Or sorry, we're basically four of us this way. I count for two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because of the hamburger thing. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're, we're five different artists to give you five different opinions, and, and you know you you have to also sort of play around and develop your own style. But um, I guess this was one, one, one last thing. Oops, um, we're back. Um, this is yeah, just sort of a thing at the end of like a transition with a, a hard cut. This might be too too technical, but like um, it's it's a nice way to um, to go from one scene. like particularly if you're going sort of you know from one very different part. If you're going from you know England to South America or something, and you're in a completely different part of the story, whatever else. People tend to sort of like read right over slug lines, like uh, these sort of little things here. But like when you're like moving between sequences or something, like you know, if you have this hard cut, like you know, uh, and it's, it's a shower full of coal stokes the flames, you know, in this train that we're in, we cut to lightning strikes, looting the legendary rock itself, Alcatraz. You're like, okay, now we, we've left this train in the middle of Indiana to now be in Alcatraz. And like, it's a very hard cut, and it sort of like really tells your tells the reader, okay, we are moving way over here in the story now. We're not just in the middle of an action scene that's just sort of continuing to roll top of uh, that, that, that's another tweet. Um, so this is a good one to talk about too because the only time I ever use cut to um, is when I'm doing a flashback. And you have to be careful about flashbacks. The only reason I put flashbacks in mind, in mind is because like one of the things I do and, and the, the people who read me know about is that I, I have a twist, and, which is a very typical thing in horror. Um, and so I don't even I don't just write cut to, I write flash cut to. You don't need to do that. Most, most people think that's just a quick cut. Um, mine are actually long cuts, and the reason I'm doing that is because there's a horror trope where a big bright light happens, and now we're seeing just a flash of, you know, Bruce Willis's wife doing that thing she does, so that we all know the thing that Bruce Willis is in that movie I won't spoil. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but you can use those. The point is, like, Blake hates cut to, and that's totally legitimate, and um, I, I use them. I don't hate really cut to. Blake advises against using them wherever possible. Strongly advises against it unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I was going to say is again, it's a, this is a real heavy spice, so you be careful with it because I've seen, and I'm sure everybody up here has seen scripts where it goes cut to, yeah, to, cut to the bathroom, from the bathroom, cut to the hall outside the bathroom. It's the lazy way to not do a slug. Yeah, it's so terrible. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's what I uh, teach my students is instead of doing the editing cues, you put a new slug line and that tells everyone in the universe that we're moving to the scene. Don't get busy. Yeah, it's, it's, these are like some of them are very strong spices that you only want to use once in a while and um, you know, dissolve to in the same way or you know, but like more often than not you want to just do it without without because like and what's interesting is all this has changed. If you like William Goldman, who I, I don't know what saying, if you William Goldman, William Goldman choreographs everything. I mean, it's, it's you know there's there's camera directions all over the place and the, you know there's cartoons all over the place. Literally every scene like in the country, but like these things evolve over time and what we're saying right now in five years might be a little bit different. And that, that's why it's important to be reading the scripts of what's on the marketplace right now. It's, it's all a conversation we're having with each other about how you do these things. And everyone's pushing the envelope trying new things. Yeah, let's see what you have But there's some conventions of, of structure and format that right. don't change. Right. And those are the ones I try to emphasize while, and while, no. while teaching and yeah. giving you feedback. And know the rules before you break We have five minutes left. Okay, we have one so we'll go ahead and take questions. So. Um, oh, by the way, yes. final draft is better. Just, yes. oh, I feel like you like avoided the entire subject. Just get a student to buy it first. <laughs> and, and, and it, actually, you hit the subject perfectly. It's $200, <laughs> so if you want to work in the studio session, you have to buy it. It's better to buy it as a student because it's 100 bucks. 
If you want to write in the studio system and you don't believe in yourself or you're not serious enough to cough up 200 bucks, go do something else. A. <laughs> Final draft too because I I prefer to see it. If somebody writes a screenplay in final draft, I don't have any problems with the format. If they write it in cell text or some of these other ones. There's always formatting problems. In fact, I'll ask sometimes, how did you do that? How did you do this? And well, the, the the software just final draft won't let you do certain things if you try and, and do it. But, but learn proper formatting. Uh, also. So the, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, I bought Final Draft when I was a student. I had Final Draft 8. I went to a screenwriting class and people wanted to collaborate and they said, oh, you have Final Draft 8? Oh, I'm sorry, you can't do the collaboration function because you don't have Final Draft 10. I was like, oh, shoot. Yeah, but you know what? The thing is, Final Draft, part of the reason I liked it is I bought the very first Final Draft when it came out and my disc was messed up. It was actually on a disc. And I, and I called them and they said, where are you? And I told them, they said, you're six blocks from us. And I went down there, and the owner of Final Draft walked out and handed me new, new discs and apologized. So that kind of like niceness really got my wow. interest. And then I bought Final Draft 5, and I used it till last year. And you can upgrade forever too. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, it's a super, super stable program. So if you don't need to do that, great. You're still in the Final Draft family. I, I, I'm using Final Draft 8, and I'm going to continue using it until I have to upgrade to for a project or whatever. Yeah. So there's a reason. Yeah. So are you saying don't even bother using the screenwriting function of Scrivener whatsoever? No. Use it, but at some point you're going to have to, to import it into Final Draft. And how easily that like and that's I guess my next question is right now I just bought Scrivener, I'm kind of getting used to it. I'm more in the novel side of things right, right. now, focus. Yeah. But my bachelor's in Scrivener. I want to keep going in that direction eventually. No, use yeah. it. Use it, use it, do your revisions in Scrivener. Use it like crazy. But when you're ready to send it out, whether to a contest or an agency or whatever, whatever opportunity you have to send it out, import it into Final Draft. And I did some reading does it, does up on... Does import easily or are there Well, I, I did some reading up on Scrivener from different websites because I'm not as familiar with it to get ready for this panel. And the, the consensus I got from the different websites I read from said that it is a pretty easy process. But that's a spectrum. It's pretty easy. Like, it, it, it's an yeah. screw Something yeah. always yeah. goes wrong. It's going to screw up your technology. Really. It's going to screw up your format. It, off of these, it keys off of these contextual elements that are built into the programming, but it also keys somewhat off of the stylistic elements. So if you use these, like, if you use a lot of all caps, it can confuse sometimes Final Draft, and suddenly you have a line of dialogue that lasts 60 pages, because you told him, man lasts whole, the character has started talking. So, did we get you the question? I had another question. Um, I don't know if there's time to answer it, but I'm like, if I have somebody in the bedroom and they're being chased throughout the house, do I cut to every single room of the house to write that sequence? Yes. Because and this is me with my producer hat on in scheduling uh, in scheduling uh, shooting days. We may be in the kitchen on one day, and three days later we're we're in the living room, and it, it is an extension of that scene. But we're shooting those on two different days. There's, there's also a way to use what they call sub slugs, sub yeah. slug lines, um, and a sub slug is it's sort of like what I was saying about with a jam. It where a hand you can say you can say they run into the hallway. And then the hallway is just its own line where, you know, as I said, they run into exterior, the hallway, same, where you say they run into the hallway, where, da, 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 and then the, but the where is in the next line. And also, if you're writing a spec, like if you're writing a shooting script, you have to do that because the line producer is the person who sits down and figure out, figures out the scheduling. He'll go nuts or she'll go nuts. But like if you're writing a spec, sometimes I'll just go, uh, you know, Victor, Victor's house, various rooms. And I'll say, yeah. she runs into the hall, followed into the kitchen because, but you have to have already laid out all of that so it's easy to transpose later. Yeah. That can't be a new element that you're laying out and being like, the house in Toto. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of those messages from behind here about small scripts, short scripts. Some of us write short fiction and we may want to kind of walk little steps before we do big ones. What, where can I find out more about writing short scripts and kind of cut my teeth and then grow my it's, it's the same. Use the same. It, it, a screenplay is, is the same format, the same conventions, regardless if you're writing a 
15 page screenplay that's going to be a short film or a 110 page screenplay. And I heard once, I, I don't write short stories, I'm going to write epics and I'll build to short stories. <laughs> um, and, there, and I think it's very accurate in some ways because if you bobble a word over 100 pages, it, you know, it's irritating, but no one will really get mad. If you bobble a word in five pages, you're screwed. So, I mean, if you're writing, you know, if your aunt is, if your aunt is financing this whole thing and you plan on, on you know, screening it at coffeehouseartjunkies.com, you can be as boring and stuff as you want, but if you really want to it's something that people are going to grab onto, it has to be like 10 times more interesting, I think. So there's some there's some great short films. Uh, there's some great short films that have been uh, later turned into feature length films. Mm -hmm. District Nine. Is mom. How, how do you Google those yeah. resources? Uh, uh, Google, Google, short Google, films. Google, Google, yeah, Google. That or part two and three. Just Google. Google. Any question you have, it used to be you had to write like uh, query short film slash five. You know, and like do this Boolean search. Now you go. I want to write short films. Where can I find them? I'm really interested in writing short films. Short films. <laughs> and, and I'll say. I want to write short films, they're really cool to find them, dot com. <laughs> Someone will have made that exact website. A lot, of, a lot of independent filmmakers will make short films, but do the festival run, then they'll throw them up on YouTube too. Short yeah. Did you guys see the Martin Freeman one with this, or the one that Martin Freeman's seen? Um, so there's one, and I can't remember, I think it's called like The Trip or The Walk, or I think it's The Walk, and it's about a zombie apocalypse, it's seven minutes long, and the only characters are a man who, who has been bitten, with his baby. Oh, he has to figure yes. out what to do with his yeah. baby. I, I have seen that. And it's so, it is the best zombie movie I've ever seen, and it's so affecting, and uh, Mark Freeman is going to be starring in the feature film adaptation, which the directors are going to do, which I think is kind of a huge mistake, because the directing is clunky. Um, but, so it does show the, the power of short films nowadays. A lot, of, a lot of literary agents want to see your script, they want to see your film. Any last questions for Kenja? WGN. Yes. Um, is that like Adam Jeffrey where once you're in, you have to, if you want to do something else, you're They will disown you and block you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just don't. And also, you can, you can still register your script with the WGA if you're not a member. It, it costs a little bit more than the they charge the members register. So it's easier to not be able to get in 12. I mean, you, it depends on which way you're going to get it. I'm getting it also. Like, they, they, they mandate people who contribute to your health fund, your retirement fund. It's, the health insurance is great. You know, um, basically, if you meet the minimum, it's earning five grand, I think, with an income, you know, as a writer for a year, your health care is covered. And then if you have a dependent, it's $600 for an entire year. Yeah, and it's like, entire family. These, these people don't know how important you are at the doctor's office, so, like, they're so nice. <laughs> They're so nice. Not really, but they, it's great. You don't have to like shop around. We live six blocks away from the big one in the valley. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you walk in there, and it's all—it's almost like first class. And, and you know, European air—they're giving you like soft, warm towels. And it's, it's, cool. it's wonderful. They're super nice. I cut my finger the other day. They sewed it back on. It's great. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You guys.